I'm going to get real with you, and that is the symbolisms of exiting the pandemic. And for you as a legit ex, uh, ex-tennis player, it was you going to the U.S. Open and seeing New York City light up. Well, first, thank you for having me, Tom. And it's really good to see you in person here by the water. It's, it's really, really nice. And the U.S. Open, what a magnificent event. After two years of not being live tennis, the crowds were there, the yeah. players were fired up, and it was the best U.S. Open I've been to it spe- ever. It speaks to the coming out of the pandemic. Yes, horrific statistics, the deaths today mirroring 1918 and such. But what are the symbols you see now in investment and in private equity development where you can say we're getting beyond this natural disaster? Creativity. I see private equity firms, investors and companies reflecting on what worked, what didn't, and how we're going to work and live going forward. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be better. For example, the hybrid world is going to be a lot better than just the in-person or the remote work. And companies are going to be able to do that more efficiently, and people are going to be able to have better lives and balance their families and their work lives A major as well. theme, which I've emphasized in the last 60 days, is strategists from a wide number of banks who say, look, the street has it wrong, the gloom has it wrong, technology is leading. It's easy to say that when you're an equity strategist. As a guy in the trenches, what does the new technology look like versus the stereotypes we hold? The new technology is totally different. See, what happens is software, if you take that as a segment of technology, is not an industry anymore. It used to be when it was on-premise, when there was no cloud computing, when there was no SaaS. Now software is becoming the entire business of companies. So are you looking out for the next Adobe? Is that what Toma Bravo is essentially doing 24-7? We're 24-7 buying and partnering with the market leaders who are leading digital transformation in their industries. And then secondly, we're partnering with the infrastructure software providers that are enabling Mm -hmm. this new cloud world. And then third, and really importantly, we're partnering with the leading cybersecurity companies that are protecting this new world and ecosystem. How does traditional business transition to the Orlando Bravo view? They've got offices hallways, they're going to lunch in midtown Manhattan, around the world, in your Miami as well. How do those, the fossils from another time and place, come over to the world you perceive in software? Culture and leadership. You really have to understand young people, what drives them. Uh, good. Take, we're extending this interview because I don't understand young people. Continue. <laughs> young people, you, you have to understand they're much more advanced. They're more philanthropic. They care more about what their job means to the world. So you have to build culture on the one hand and mm-hmm. adapt to that. And at the same time, you have to have leadership that gets it, that gets the memo that if they mm-hmm. don't, immediately look at digital transformation, they're going to fall behind. On radio and TV, we say good morning to Tim Cook. He was up in front of Apple employees a couple days ago. It didn't go well. They were upset about certain themes and topics. How would you recommend to the great tech giants that they adapt and adjust to to the new youth of America? I love this phrase, the geriatric millennials. How do they adapt to them? Run decentralized organizations where you build a culture of trust, where you can delegate responsibility and authority. That way, the young and future leaders that we have will have broader jobs, broader roles, and therefore they can be more creative in doing that. How do you do that that with command and control? I mean, how did Hewlett and Packard in a garage 40 years ago, 50 years ago, did they do that? Did they delegate in that way? Command and control does not work anymore. Mm -hmm. It's illusory control. You may feel like you are in control when you see all of your employees in the office, but you're really not. Once again, it's a culture of trust and delegation, and that's the new way businesses will be running. Just because of time, I want to get to this. Is there a partition in investment return? Have you adjusted a perceived seven-year internal rate of return for the future? Or do you see the same old great news that Tomo Brava has had for decades? Do you see it just because of your execution excellence? Or do you have to bring down expected returns? Ah, 
I cannot talk about returns because we're on live TV and I'm not allowed as a private equity firm to talk about it. Now, what I can tell you is the fundamentals of the companies that we're investing in Please. have never, ever okay. been better. And our ability at Toma Bravo to improve operations of companies only in mm -hmm. partnership with existing management. Think about delegation and culture that way. That remains intact. I need to take the rest of our time and speak about your Puerto Rico and your true investment into Miami. You've done your work in New York with Sloan Kettering and others. But give us that, that unique linkage right now of Miami and an expanding southern Florida with all of Latin America. What does the new relationship look like? Well, we are a, we're a creative young firm. And we knew we needed an office on the East Coast. So where do we go? Miami. Miami is a very diverse society. It's a growing place, and it's a place where young entrepreneurs can make a big difference and build their own community and also be celebrated as capitalists. So we're really mm -hmm. excited about that. Of course, for me personally, it's close to Puerto Rico. Uh, where you're, I have, you're talking uh, your own book. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> okay, what, is, what does Manhattan do? Looking down 6th Avenue, U, UBS, Alliance, Bernstein, and the rest, they're afraid, their clients, they're afraid their employees will move south because of tax law. Do you predict that's going to occur? Somewhat, but not too much, because New York City is the best city in the world. Uh, it, it really is. I feel all these movements are additive. Think about it, San Francisco and New York mm -hmm. City, how many more knowledge workers mm -hmm. can you have? How many more new buildings can you build? Uh, right. Artists were being driven out. Uh, other parts mm -hmm. of society were being marginalized. So this is an additive, uh, positive movement to those cities. I need you to give us an update on your Puerto Rico, the horrific uh, natural disasters we've seen. You've obviously provided major philanthropy. There are all these stereotypes, the 51st state debate, um, the knowledge base of so many people is one song, Despacito, and the rest of it. Straighten us out right now about the new and future of Puerto Rico. What I'm seeing in Puerto Rico now is the, talking about young leaders, the young leaders of family businesses and young leaders that are entrepreneurs are very different than the prior generation. They really deeply care about integrating a society. Puerto Rico is one of the most unequal places in terms of income in the world. If it was a country, it would rank in the top five. Mm -hmm. And I am seeing the young business community caring about that and looking to change that. How do you address crime? Not corruption, but how do you address every stereotype I've heard of Puerto Rico and crime? How do you fix that for the children of Puerto Rico in the future? Crime is a byproduct of poverty. Yes. It, it's not like people are bad. So you have to address income inequality and poverty. And we do that in our foundation in a big way. That is mm -hmm. the mission of our foundation, is provide opportunities for talented young adults that otherwise wouldn't have one. Mm -hmm. And the poverty rate is just too high. Now, the system has to change, the culture have to cha has mm -hmm. to change, and businesses have to get involved. The image now of too many Haitians desperate beneath the bridges of our borders. What is your advice to the Biden administration? I've had landmark interviews with Carlos Gutierrez as one example about what to do. It's a nation's angst. What's your recommendation on immigration policy for the Biden administration? When it is an issue to the level that it has risen to, which is a humanitarian crisis, you have to open your borders to those people that are suffering. I mean, we live in the world together. Of course, the constituents are American citizens that voted you to be president, but it's a humanitarian crisis. Mm -hmm. And by the way, this is going on throughout the Caribbean, in mm -hmm. Cuba, in Haiti, sometimes well, in Puerto Rico, and, and all over. And when, when these things that are this big happen, you have to adjust.